Welcome to Spill the Tea. Today I'm speaking with Denise Darling, a historical romance author. Welcome to Spill the Tea, and today we're talking to Denise Darling. I hope I've um, pronounced that right. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Awesome. And she has a lovely novella called An Un- A Heart Unsure, and it's a historical romance. Would you like to tell us a little bit about it, Denise? Yes. I printed it off yesterday. So it's mostly an ebook, but I can print it off as a PDF. <laughs> so I printed off my little historical romance. It's um it's inspirational. So mm-hmm. it's got matters of faith in it as well. Um I I started a long time ago. My mum loved Jane Austen and when I was a little girl <laughs> she would talk about the Jane Austen movie. And when I was about 10, she put one on. And I remember years later telling my mother that I was bored at the ball scene. And she was like, but that's the first scene of the movie. <laughs> and, well, it's safe to say that I eventually learned how to not be bored in Jane Austen. And I absolutely love her now. <laughs> but, you know, first introductions, maybe not so good at the age of 10. But I now love it. Watched all kinds of Jane Austens, the adaptions and this, that and the other. But there was one in particular that, um, of course, the Colin Firth one that most people love. Yes. Um, The opening scene with Lizzie walking through the woods. And I thought, that doesn't belong in this Pride and Prejudice story. It belongs in another book. And so I wrote a book and then wrote lots of other books. And in my research about, um, about that series and working on it, I thought, oh, I know. I'm going to start earlier so this book is set in 1763 Mm -hmm. so it's like a backstory to the ones the regency ones when we get there (laughs) so it's got a lot of backstories a lot of people that you meet later in the main series and so this is where you get the introduction to them and how they influence the characters later on in life but this story is about julie so that's her there there's julie Julie is a typical English lady. She wants to marry the Baron and she wants to have lots of money and gowns and jewels and all the pretty things in the world. And I think then, that's kind of uh, typical of a lot of ladies here. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Very typical. But, but okay. there, there's only there's only one that's been paying her any attention. And she thinks she might have him on the hook. But right about the moment she's about to get all settled and thinks everything's good, her dad invites this penniless clergyman to stay with them because he has nowhere else to stay because, well, he's penniless. (laughs) And he's all wrong. You know, he's not going to give her jewels. He's not going to give her gowns. And she begins to wonder, though, if maybe Mr. Wrong is actually Mr. Right. But that's where the heart on short comes in. She's not sure. Mm -hmm. Is he right? Is he wrong? And I also write it from Andrew's point of view, Andrew Hatfield, the clergyman. And, you know, he's devoted his life to God. And Julie is not interested in that kind of life. (laughs) And so he has his own unsure heart. Do I stay with God or do I pursue um, another avenue that would allow me to be with Julie? Mm -hmm. And so they've got two people unsure. What do I do? Do I go this way? Do I go that way? And where are we going to go? Of what's going to happen and that is a heart I'm sure awesome now I see on your website that this is a um basically it's it's a signing up for the newsletter and you can get the the story for free now yes. do you have other books that you are writing in this era or um is this your your first one out well this would technically be my second one out oh, okay. I had an earlier I had an earlier reader's magnet that people could sign up for, but it's not in print anymore. Mm -hmm. I've decided to take it out of print, but I'm releasing another one later this year. Um, So that one will be on Amazon and I haven't decided if it's going to be wide or just Amazon. That's still a decision I'm making. (laughs) But yes, so I was just working with my, um, you get to do fun things in my newsletter. Like I asked everybody what they want the title of the next book to be. be. Mm -hmm. So I gave them a couple of choices and I even gave them the option of making a suggestion if they liked. So um, I was interested in that yesterday. It's a close tie right now. That tends to be the way when I ask people, (laughs) there's close ties. (laughs) 
<laughs> so a heart unsure. No clear answer. Sure by one vote. <laughs> by one vote. Oh, by well, one vote. See, see, your vote can make a difference, people. It can. Earlier in the year, there's another story I'm writing. It's not going to be released for a little while. I asked if they wanted a puppy or an old hunting dog in the story. And it ended up as a tie. So we have both the puppy and the old hunting dog in the story. <laughs> so definitely your votes count. <laughs> you never know how close it's going to be. <laughs> and your your but, other um, story that you're working on towards releasing, is it also yeah. set in the Georgian period? It is. So right now, all of my books are set in the Georgian period. So I include, the Georgian period also includes the Regency. So I'll be in mm -hmm. the Georgian period for quite some time. Um, just while we get to know everybody and figure out what everybody's story does. Because I know when I read a series, there's other people in the books that you think, ah, oh, couldn't they have gotten a story too? What happened to them? <laughs> Those side characters. Uh, <laughs> do the side characters they need their own stories so for a little while I'll be in the Georgian period including the Regency as well mm -hmm. so um this my next story that for the end of the year it's set a year before this one okay because when I was writing A Heart on Shore it was supposed to be set in 1763 and then I dug up a journal from John Wesley he he wrote meticulous notes in his journal which can sometimes be a little boring to read, but also got wealths of information that most people, you know, wouldn't bother writing in their journal. Mm -hmm. But makes so much better for people that don't live in that world to understand what it was like. <laughs> so I was reading it, but um, the year 1763, most of the months, both a little bit before and till about June, had been redacted. And I was like, oh, well, that's not very useful. <laughs> Because I do actually have John Wesley. He's a side character, a very minor character in the story. But the clergyman works with him. Okay. And so I thought, well, if I read John Wesley's journals, I'll know what he's up to and what he's been doing. And well, I finally dug up a less redacted journal online and found out why probably they pulled out all of those months. There was a massive, there was, there was a church split mm. um, and there was a fellow that, um, had decided that the world was going to end on February the 28th and caused a big scandal all through London. And it was like, oh, no wonder they decided let's maybe not write about 1763. So I decided maybe my story didn't really fit in that. <laughs> and I changed it to 1764, different time, mm -hmm. past all the scandal. But then um, I couldn't get, I couldn't stop thinking about George Bell and his prediction of the world ending. And my pastor preached a sermon and the Apostle Paul was talking about how he was rejoicing whether or not he was in prison and there were people preaching about Jesus. Um, some of them were preaching sincerely and some of them were preaching trying to hurt the church. As false and Paul prophets. Said, yes. Sorry? As false prophets. As false prophets false prophets other things like that and well I don't know if it was false prophets or not all I know is that Paul said he rejoiced either way and I thought well why would you be happy about someone that's trying to hurt the church that seems rather bizarre Maybe. <laughs> and my pastor was preaching about it and talking about it and then I began to think about George Bell and I'm mm. like we also know in Romans that God says that everything works out for good. And I'm like, well, what about George Bell? <laughs> Is there a way for George's, George Bell's, that his disruption, the way he really hurt the Methodist church in its um, beginnings, um, is there a way for that to have been good? And that's my challenge and what I'm writing, a way for that situation to have come something good. That's a very interesting challenge. I mean, I really, like. when you think about it, it's 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 interesting because it, it yeah, it's kind of scandalous at the time. We all know it didn't happen. Oh, but yeah. <laughs> how how you know all the threads can come together? It's yeah. So it's not um, that mystery the, aspect, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that that's that, that was my challenge right now, and I'm I'm this close to finishing it. My first draft. 
So um, that's exciting, getting very close to the end and mm -hmm. just um, just making sure right now I'm sticking to, this is actually a novelette. So yeah. um, this one and the next one I'm writing is a novelette um, because I'm still entering, I haven't this year so far, but I'm still entering unpublished competitions oh, and okay. the ones I enter allow novelettes. So um, I'm still looking for an agent because I'd like to be um, traditionally published, but I'm not there mm -hmm. just yet. So I'm still doing indie published right now and we'll see how we go. I mean, if I get lots of support, maybe I won't go the traditional. <laughs> it's it's one knows? of those things where it's like, if, if you have the opportunity, I think it's really nice, but yeah. if it doesn't, you know, come through because, you know, it's, it's competitive, right? It, it does, is. doesn't necessarily reflect the quality of writing. It reflects competitiveness because a lot of the people apply. So if it doesn't, yeah. then indie publishing is definitely there as a backup, which is nice to have that option. It is. And I've enjoyed being able to release something instead mm -hmm. of, besides my newsletter, of course, <laughs> but um, be able to release some things for people to read some stories. And um, so I like romance, of course. So I've got romance in my stories, but it's also got um, matters of faith, mm -hmm. as you can tell from what how I've been talking. <laughs> it's got some matters of faith in there. <laughs> so we grapple with... Um, I didn't talk a lot about the romance though. So um, there is. Well, let's talk a little um, bit about the romance then. <laughs> let's talk a little about the romance. So I've told you about Julie and Andrew mm -hmm. and how they meet. So she gets dragged along to a Methodist meeting against her will. She didn't want to go, <laughs> but her dad insisted. And um, that's where she meets Andrew. So that's in a heart, I'm sure she meets Andrew at a Methodist meeting. And he's wondering what on earth this beautiful ladies doing in this tiny village outside London she's what's she doing there until he sees her father and he's actually good friends with her father and he's all excited because he realizes oh she finally came you know it's an answer to prayer she finally came we've been hoping for her but through the service he keeps realizing that he's been watching her and not paying attention to the sermon and um he starts to realize that maybe there's a problem here that I might be in danger of um my heart might be in danger here. I've got to start paying attention to what I'm here for. And Julie, Julie's most, for most of the book, she, she's unsure what she's going to do because it's during her call towards God at the same time. And she really likes Andrew because he's calm and he's collected and he doesn't go wildly off in the middle of everywhere else. And, you know, her dad gets, her dad has a bit of a temper mm. and, uh, Andrew's the one that's sitting there going, you know, let's calm down. And he says, he says things that makes a go, oh, you know, I really like this guy that I wanted to marry. I really kind of wish he was like Andrew because Andrew's so nice. <laughs> or maybe, you know, couldn't Andrew be a secret baron or something? That would be nice. Because <laughs> <laughs> she really wants her title. She wants to be a lady. <laughs> but those are, that's Andrew and Julie. And in the book that's coming up, we have Edith and Clarence. That's mm -hmm. the book that's coming up. We have Edith and Clarence. They were neighbours in London. So since they were little, because most of the gentry, they would have a townhouse and then they would have their country estates. So they don't live anywhere near each other in the country. But every year since they were little, their parents would come. And um, I know typically most gentry actually left their kids in the country. But for this story, I've had the parents bring the kids to the city with them for the season. So ever since they were little, they're childhood friends that become more. And that's in my next story, childhood friends that become more. And in A Heart Unsure, it's two strangers that meet and become more. <laughs> so with your stories, um, are you looking for any particular tropes in them? Like you said, childhood friends who become more, that's, that's kind of one, like best friends, right? Um, are you in, like interspersing them or thinking about them and furthering in your series? There's no set one. No, I just, um, in this particular time when I was deciding, someone had mentioned that childhood friends to more trope. And I'm like, I love that trope. I should write a book about that trope. <laughs> But for the most part, no, I don't set out with a trope mm. to um, most of the time I look at my book later because people are asking me to describe it. I'll look at my book after I wrote it and think, all right, I'm sure I wrote tropes in there. Which ones did I use? 
<laughs> so, so, so I'll you, this, I'm in there. So I'm taking it. You might be a bit of a pantser. <laughs> well, I'm back and forth. I was, oh. I used to be very much a plotter and I still do have an outline. I try mm-hmm. and have an outline of what they ought to be doing, particularly in a novelette. So I'm restricting myself to less than 15,000 words and that's about 50 pages. So if you don't write some kind of outline, you will be well over 15,000 words before you blink. Um, <laughs> I know a lot of people, when I was in school, if, you know, teacher told me I had 15,000 words, it was like, oh no, I can't write for that long. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm an author, I turn around and go, oh, I just dropped a thousand words. <laughs> it's very easy to do now. <laughs> we we become more practice at it, right? <laughs> yeah. The um, I don't necessarily look at my book via tropes, though. I look at it as um, what do I want to happen? And mm. or I know what I want to happen. So where is it going to happen? And who's going to be saying what and whose head we're going to be in? Um, I I used to only write from the girl's point of view and I still have some books that are in the waiting. I have a lot of books that are in the waiting um, that are just from the girl's point of view, but my novelettes are both um, female and male. Mm-hmm. So when it's very short, you really do have to make sure you know whose head you're in and get the scenes really worked out because otherwise um, you'll be way over 15,000 words before you blink. But um Anyway, I have enjoyed writing them and enjoyed, um, just enjoyed, I, I, I love the faith aspect, but I also love the romance. Um, it's clean. So there's, um, I think, I think this book, this book only has a near kiss. <laughs> so I like the anticipation and the build, not necessarily the, when you have that moment of building and the tension and, mm-hmm. um, not necessarily actually need to get to the kids part sometimes it's nice when they do but it depends but um I go back and forth depending on which book because a lot of the a lot of the time back then you either did well the good girls didn't necessarily kiss but <laughs> so I still have some kisses here and there but it depends mm-hmm. on the book and it depends on the story but otherwise I do like um a lot of that tension such as um oh it's the Kira Knightley Pride and Prejudice where you see um, Mr. Darcy hands her up into the carriage and they touch with bare hands. And as he's walking away, he flexes his hand because he touched her. And I've, I've always loved that small moments that um, really build some tension. And so that's the way I write with that, that anticipation and the tension, not necessarily passionate. I'm not a swoony kisser kind of person. <laughs> I don't write that way. You like the build up and the the nuances of the emotions in there. Yes. And the all the unsure of well does he or doesn't he or what nearly happened there? Did he almost? <laughs> so I'm gonna ask the, the yeah. question because I know everybody's gonna wanna know. By the way, I love your teacup, the little bird on there, very cute. Um what is your favorite Jane Austen film or television series? Oh, I know it's a hard one. It is. I know mine, but I'm I'm a little different too. <laughs> well, I loved the Colin Firth one. Watched it more times than than probably was wise with my <laughs> sisters and my mum. Um, but my dad also loved um, Persuasion, mm-hmm. and I've forgotten I've forgotten the actors that are in it. Um which which of the persuasions it is but um it would have been one of the ones that was around when the Colin first one was because I've forgotten the actor's name himself but between those two I loved uh, my mum loved Pride and Prejudice and I do like it but I think I was always drawn to persuasion it was one of my I don't know it has that tension that I love that um lost love and um the is he isn't he um, yes, he is. And, and I love the letter at the end of Persuasion. That letter was just beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, I love how each of her books brought different things to the fore. Like yeah. it, they really did, you know, different 
different aspects of relationships and and all the little pieces in between. My favorite yeah. is um, the BBC uh, miniseries special of Emma, which has yeah. Ramona and Johnny in it as the main characters, um, Knightley and Emma. And I just love that one because of the humor in it. <laughs> it's very bright. It's, it's a little comical. And I don't know, just just hits on all my boxes. <laughs> Yeah, there, there, there's a lot of adaptions. I'd have to go look up who they are, and then I'm sure I've watched it. But, um, I, I drew the line at the zombie, but oh, otherwise yes. <laughs> I've watched everything else. I watched the zombie one. I'm like, not really. <laughs> I was sort of like, I started the zombie one because someone convinced me to start it, and I'm just like, no, I'm going to draw the, draw the line at the zombie one. That that That's it. So I'm sure I've watched the Emma one that you're talking about, but I'll have to look up the actors, the actors later to see their faces and then go, oh yes, I know that one. <laughs> and you know what, what the funniest thing is? Like, reach up here a second. Everything doesn't fall down on me. I just yeah. picked up a copy of Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> oh yeah. That's the hand. Yeah, there we <laughs> And then a nice, cute little adaption. I don't know if you've seen this or not. Lost in Austin. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I've watched that one. <laughs> Told you I've watched almost all of them. <laughs> all the little knockoff ones. <laughs> the knockoff one. There's even an Indian one, which I absolutely love. But um, I've forgotten what it's called. But there's an Indian one, which I loved too. Because my sister, um, she married, um, her mother-in-law was grew up in Pakistan. Oh, okay. And so she understood a lot of the culture. And mm -hmm. so we sat there and watched it with us and she was explaining why they did why they did certain things. And so it still always had a very soft spot in my heart. Um, my mother-in-law's not with us anymore. So it definitely oh. has a soft spot in my heart now. Mm -hmm. Well, not my mother-in-law, my sister's mother-in-law. Um the it's just remembering her as well. And so mm -hmm. um, but I love the story anyway, because they don't kiss in that one either. It has all that tension that comes up to it and then my sister found out the reason they don't kiss is because the actress said that's not in her contract that she won't oh. kiss <laughs> and um I was sort of like oh because there was that part of me that goes oh come on can we have a little kiss at the end? just at the end to, to satisfy <laughs> but then uh then when I found out about the actress and her reason that she didn't want to and I'm like oh, okay I'll respect that that's fine but it still has all of that tension and Oh, that's what I like to feel. write <laughs> all the feels yeah all the feels all the feels so what drew you to become a historical writer well I would say that would be my mum <laughs> getting me interested in Jane Austen <laughs> but also my sister um I'm the youngest mm -hmm. and my middle the middle sister she loved to tell stories and um she was the story writer and she would make the room all dark and she'd sit in a rocker and she'd weave us this fascinating story and I can't she's definitely an off-the-cuff kind of writer and I can't do that I wouldn't be able to shut the door and tell the story but um I loved the suspense and the interest and I thought oh I'd love to write like that and I don't write exactly like that I write my own way but um definitely I would say the historical part started with that BBC Colin Firth and that opening scene when I decided that opening scene belonged in a different book. <laughs> and from there on out, there was I was I was in historical. But um I did like historicals. I like Westerns and um I used to read a lot of that kind of stuff as well. So yeah. Yeah, that that moment when I decided that that scene belonged in a different book and I was going to write it. Mm -hmm. was probably the moment when I ended up being in this Georgian England era and that's what I wrote it <laughs> and was it like a natural thing to bring your faith into these books as well that that didn't occur at the start so when I started writing it was very like Jane Austen she went to church but you you know they just went to church it wasn't necessarily a big faith point in it and when I was writing and I kept re kept thinking, well, my books seem to be missing a point. There's something, there's not a point to these. It was just a nice story. 
Mm -hmm. And it became more of a crisis of my own faith that I realized that I was just happy to be a Christian and not necessarily get to know God. And I realized that I wasn't where I ought to be. And if my faith really meant something to me, then it ought to, it ought to be there more. I actually should want to read my Bible instead of saying, oh, I ought to read my Bible. I'm not saying, I still don't say that some days because there's some days that I'm like, you've really got to do it because you know you're going to enjoy it. And you know, if you don't, then you're going to wind up somewhere far away from God. But um, it was just that moment that I realized that um, that was like book four or book five in my main series. I told you there's a lot of books that I haven't gotten to yet. <laughs> These are just the novelette. They're the, they're the little tasters becoming there. Lots of books. So um, I had a, govern uh, a governess who was talking to kids and trying to teach them things. And her grandmother sat her down and said, um, teach them all the mor morals in the world that you like. But when they're looking up from hell, because you never taught them about God, what's more important? Mm -hmm. Should you have told them how much you loved them or should you have told them how much God loved them? And um, that's when I looked at myself and when here you are writing a book and preaching to yourself. Because <laughs> how, how, isn't it important that instead of just talking to people about nice things and about morals, shouldn't you be telling them about God? Because he's more important than anything. And so therein came, all in my books, most of them, the, the part about God is things that I've learned. So um, things that I've learned, things that God had taught me and um, that just, it's a natural part of my life. And so it ends mm -hmm. up in my stories, <laughs> but it didn't at the start. And then I sort of realized that maybe that wasn't such a good thing. And um, I needed to look at my stories again. And um, that's where it became, I changed my own life in writing that I needed to, be more of what I profess to be. You're shining your light. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> shining my light. Rather than keeping it under the bushel, you're shining your light. Yes. So that um that's where it's ended up with the inspirational part. I mean, I do still love to read a book that's just clean and people go to church and there's nothing deep in it. It's just a nice romance. I do like reading those books, mm -hmm. but I also love reading a book that challenges me and challenges my faith and makes me think and um that's where I write from that um challenging parts that um most people can see because we all get like Julie and Andrew and a heart I'm sure we all get to that moment where we're like we're at a road which way do I go do I go mm -hmm. this way or do I go that way <laughs> and we all get to that moment where we're not sure and we're looking up at God and praying and going, well, which way? It'd be really nice if you could just, you know, maybe light up one of them. <laughs> Point, light a up. Sign. A sign, please. <laughs> How do I know which way to go? And, um, so that that's what I write, some things that I hope that people can sit there and enjoy the story, love the story, but maybe they'll also have that moment that makes them go, hmm, would I do this or would I do that? Which mm -hmm. one would I do and which one should I do? And um, yeah, so like in this one, the matters of faith for Andrew is, will I stay a clergyman and stay to my commitment to God? Will I become something else, become the gentleman that Julie wants? And, um, and Julie's, will I pursue all my gowns and my jewels and my pretty little things or will I choose something else will I choose God who's telling me I mean in this one uh Wesley was particular he wanted people to dress in black and white mm. that's John Wesley's thing is it everybody ought to black, dress in black and white and of course that's very against Julie's my pretty gowns and my jewels and my <laughs> black and white why would I want to dress in black and white <laughs> But um, so think Amish and something along that line, the black mm. and white of the Amish. And so that's where Julie, but no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want to do that. I like my pretty colours. She likes the creativity to express herself. Yeah. yeah. 
but um but there yeah. are those, uh, those uh choices you know we all come up against them we have to choose which yes. path we're going to take and and yeah it it uh reflects real life that way um it does yeah but there's also there's also a character in the book that doesn't understand the choices so mm -hmm. you get that in real life as well you get someone that just looks at you and says but why yeah and even if you try and explain it they're still but why <laughs> <laughs> because that to them it's an alien concept right why <laughs> why would you do that <laughs> so you know yeah, that's that part of real life of you will mm -hmm. get that in real life you'll get the moments where you have to decide which way you're going to go and you'll get the people that just don't get it very true so um now obviously at, at first you didn't intend to kind of go into this niche of you know historical faith driven s stories but now that you have um are you finding that there is a, a good audience for those type of stories? Personally, I, I think there would be, and that yeah. it would be a very loyal audience once you have them. But what's yeah. your experience? Well, sometimes that's the part about being an author. You have to learn to find the audience. Mm -hmm. So I know I've loved historical faith driven, um, but I also write first person. So um, that's made it a little bit more unique as well as there's a huge regency but not that many people in the 1700s so I'm chasing those up and finding them here and there they're there <laughs> but it's finding them and um because I know even when I was when sometimes when I look at a Georgian and I think oh wigs and I don't write people with wigs because <laughs> <laughs> I still don't like wigs so I don't put wigs in my story and um I've got a humorous one in the next one but that's the girl laughs at the guy because he's wearing a wig and he doesn't wear one for the rest of the book. So uh, <laughs> I don't I don't focus on their fashion because in a lot of other ways, they're similar to the Regency period, except mm -hmm. for the the wigs and the big hoops and the and um I just don't always but I don't bother to focus on the parts of Georgian England that I don't like. <laughs> I just leave that part off <laughs> and write the story because there were people underneath of all of those fashions. And people are always interesting. Yes. Right. And um, so that's what I focus on, the people in this time. And because there was a lot of other interesting things going on. Um, I I mean, I don't actually end up with a Methodist part in my main series, but there's Methodist influences. And it was such a big time and such a change. And even Jane Austen's nephew, he when he wrote... Um, about his aunt he said that you know a lot of people asked about her faith and he said you know she lived a quiet faith but she had faith but he also acknowledged that in the time I think he was writing in the Victorian period he's like in the time you know everybody wants to know what you believe and they want you to be vocal about it and that was not Jane Austen's time Jane Austen's time was you were quieter but a lot of that revival and the the fervor started earlier with people like John Wesley mm -hmm. and I find that interesting fascinating to look at what happened and that's when the church had a big big kabooey I mean it's I don't make it a big part of the book because it's a lot about the romance but it's there and what can happen and what what's going on and what do you do when you've got someone wandering around preaching that the world's going to end on February the 28th <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't choose the 29th, you know, leap year. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't a leap year. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, we are running out of time, which is unfortunate because I really enjoyed talking to you. So for Thank our you. lovely audience members, if they're interested in signing up for your newsletter and getting an unsure heart, the link is going to be in the description. So you can just go right there. I'll also put the link to your website in there. So if they want to take a tour through that, they can. And again, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much. It's been a blast. <laughs>